great to be here. Um, we're going to dive straight into the material. We have a bunch of slides that we want to present to you today. Um, so first of all, uh, introduction before we dive in. I'm Ann Mirako. I am a co-founder of Floodgate, where we do very early stage investments. Uh, I am actually in charge, uh, along with two other partners, of making new investments. So we select uh, the companies that will go into our portfolio. Um, and then today I wanted to also have Iris join me here, as Iris actually has a fairly unique role within our firm. Yeah. Um, so my name is Iris Troy. I'm a partner also at Floodgate. And as Anne referenced, I actually lead all of our follow-on investing. And that's quite unconventional in uh, venture capital firms, so let me explain. Uh, what we realize at Floodgate is because we're seed stage investors, we often say that we're co-conspirators along with the founders. Uh, we get in early or far too early, and we take that leap of faith before others believe. Uh, but what we realize about ourselves is that we're at risk of falling irrationally in love with our founders and the companies we've invested in. Uh, but as VCs, we have a fiduciary duty to our limited partners, the people whose money we are investing on their behalf, to optimize every dollar for the maximum impact. And so what we realize is that the same framework that we use for taking that first leap of faith doesn't necessarily apply for companies at later stages. And that's the second realization, is that we should be using a different criteria set and a different comparison for companies when we're considering uh, doing our Parada, for example, in like a Series A or Series B, versus the framework that we use to evaluate them for the seed stage. And so at Floodgate, we've decided to actually use two different processes for deciding about that first check-in. So my partners, Mike, Ann, or Arjun, will come to the partnership and be willing to what we say, pound the table, saying, I want to lead this investment. But for every stage after, or every check after that first one, it's a different process where I will partner with whoever the lead investor was to say, given the stage that the company is at, is, still, is this still the best use of our funds? So a couple of things. We, we write check sizes somewhere between 500000 and as large as 3 or $4 million, but our, our median check size is between one and one5 And as Iris says, uh, she allows us to irrationally fall in love with our companies and maintain that love so that she can come in and be an objective partner to us on how the company is doing. And it's allowed us to maintain sort of the role that we have and our, our own spirit animal um, while actually being a great business partner to our companies. Yeah, and in that vein, one additional comment is just when we think about this, oftentimes we get the question of, isn't that a little bit odd to your founders to feel like they're going to be repitching the partnership? We actually view it differently, which is that, and this is a theme that you'll see in our presentation, the expectations change for every stage of growth that you're at and for each round of funding that you do. And we feel like it's part of our kind of service level agreement with our founders that we are going to serve as coaches through that fundraising journey with them. So a little bit of context setting. The path to becoming a legendary company is one that is known for being quite treacherous. But we thought it'd be helpful to kind of remind you of some of the challenges that you may face along the way. And so we wanted to provide some data. What we did was gather up the companies that successfully raised a seed round sometime between 2008 and 2010. And there were, as you can see here, 1,119 of them. Now, I'd like to point out that the time frame that we're talking about, 2008 to 2010, is when iconic companies like Airbnb got started, and many of the companies that you've probably heard rumors of that are going to go public sometime this year. So there may be a temptation to look back at that time period and say, that was just something magical. There were a ton of great companies that got started. But I think we have the data to show it was still very much like a winning lottery ticket. So of the companies that got successfully seed funded, only about 3% of them actually successfully then went on to raise more than five rounds of funding. About two-thirds of them run into what I would consider to be almost like a fundraising ceiling, where they get to a stage past which they just can't seem to successfully fundraise. Now, of those companies, about a third of them were able to get to an exit of some sort. But even those that exit, more than two-thirds of them don't exit for more than $50 million. So you can see, at some point, most companies either plateau or honestly start going sideways. 
And I think it's an interesting data point because although we've all become very accustomed to the icon of the unicorn, that these days we talk about it almost as if that is the assumed outcome for a startup, it's still a very challenging path to get to that status. And you can see here that it's actually about only 1% of companies that successfully raise a seed fund that will ultimately be valued at greater than a billion dollars. And that leads to the question of, well, what happens to all the other companies? Well, if you're not able to fundraise, at some point, you probably either have to shut down or you have to find a way to control your own fate. And the latter probably means you have to batten down the hatches, reduce your forces, and basically just eke it by. And while you don't have the capital to reinvest in your company, you become what's kind of become known in the Valley as the walking dead of startups. You're not growing, but you're not shutting down. You're kind of just getting by. And so this slide will show you, obviously, how important it is to have access to capital throughout your entire journey. However, we don't want to overemphasize that access to capital, while it's a factor, is by any means a predictor of success. What we've done here is actually listed out the most funded companies that failed over the last two years. And what I would point out is that there's two of them that burned through almost a billion dollars of capital before they shut down. It's, it's fascinating because as venture capitalists, as most of you know, we take a portfolio approach to investing. The expectation has to be that several of our companies will fail, but we're going for the grand slam hits, right? We're swinging for the fences. So in some sense, the crazier, the harder the idea to implement, the higher beta there will be at the back end. But for us, it begs the question of, should companies actually be burning this much cash only to fail? And, and so I think, you know, this high loss rate is, is something that we've gotten accustomed to, actually, even within venture capital. But um, the co consumption of capital to us is something that we, we felt was really important to understand. Um, I, I think startups basically have two ways in which they can go, right? You could either create value or you destroy value. Someone once said to me, you know, and you either want to own more of a company or you want to own none of it. Um, and it's true. So when companies are creating value, they're actually literally creating shareholder value by figuring out who their customers are and building great products for that customer and building great organizations. But you can actually destroy value. You can destroy value by consuming too much capital at a rate that doesn't make any sense for your business. Um, so what have we learned that helps founders actually avoid this? The main thing we like to say to founders is you have to hack value before you hack growth. So the, the stage of investing that I sit at that I feel like Floodgate is exceptional at is understanding how to hack value. What does that mean? That means there's this whole question of product market fit. How do you achieve it? You know, how do you get there? And what's really interesting is that value hacking is exactly that. You're supposed to be hacking value to figure out what product market fit you have. It's being in a great market. It's being able to actually have profitable growth at some point, if that's something that you choose. Um, and it's, it's actually having a product that attacks a market where people are really willing to pay you for the value that you create. And Product market fit ends up being like the most important thing that early stage investors are looking for. And everyone loves to tweet about it, right? Mark Andreessen has a whole blog post on how do you figure out whether or not you have product market fit and what is it? Sam Altman talks about it, Andrew Chen, Eric Ries. Everyone is talking about product market fit and how it is so important. But you've got to this point by raising a seed round, right? And and we understand, we see this over and over again. You've raised your seed round, you don't have a lot of cash, you don't even have a lot of team members, maybe you don't even have a product or customers, and you certainly don't have that much time. And the question that's probably burning in the back of your head is I know everyone keeps talking about product market fit. How in the world do I even get there? Who's written about that? And when we looked around, we couldn't find lots of examples of people telling you how to get to product market fit. They might tell you to experiment, 
but they wouldn't tell you what to experiment on or why. And so we say, this is what it feels like, right? And you get the seed financing, you get your product market fit. And we always say, and then a miracle happens sometime in that middle. Um, and each story from every founder seems slightly different. So we feel like there's a few lessons that we've learned throughout our 10 years growing floodgate of what we start to see about that period. And there's a lot more details into uh, what we think actually goes into even the three lessons. Unfortunately, we only have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to fly through them. Um, lesson one, the path to product market fit is often unpredictable. I don't mean just in terms of the pivots that you might go through. The timing actually is very unpredictable. And this is something people will not tell you. They'll say, 18 months from now, you're going to be raising your Series A. And so you're like, okay, 18 months from now, I'm going to have product market fit because that's just the timeline of the startup. Not true. We've seen companies take 24, 36 months to get to product market fit. You need to make sure that your investors are on board with that journey. Lesson number two, you don't need a growth hacker at this stage. You don't need the dude in the hoodie who's going to tell you how you're going to invest a million dollars of your $1.5 million into marketing campaigns, right? You need a value proposition. You need customers. You need a product that actually fulfills a problem that a customer has. That's your job number one. Companies that are startups, you are trying to prove that you should exist. You aren't saying, like, I got series seed financing, so therefore I have earned the right to exist. No, you have earned the right to prove that you ought to exist. But you still have to make that proof happen. Number three, rapidly collect earned secrets. This is the most important thing. We talk about the, the journey, the maze that the, the, the founder is going through, all of those secrets that you are figuring out. You want to go through as many experimentations as possible to figure out the market secrets, the technical secrets, the customer secrets. And the more you get these earned secrets, the more value you have as a customer. And if you need to pivot, you'll have the ability to do so. So let me take you through an example of a company that we invested in. I invested in Zimride in 2010, August. We put in $1.2 million at an unbelievable valuation of $5 million post. And Zimride was a platform sold to universities that enabled people to share the ride, carpool, right? Uh, we thought transportation was a really interesting area. No one else was in the space, not even Uber at the time. Um, the only other company that was in the space was Zipcar. So we thought, great, it's a space that's a big blank space, we're going to go after it. We knew that they had to get some level of density within a market, so they went to corporations after universities. And they raised their Series A based on the traction they had with their platforms. But the continued conversation was, how do you get density of people taking rides with one another? How do you do that? And ultimately, they launched in 2012 Lyft, which was a mobile app. And it was only after a series of experimentations where Logan Green, the CEO of Lyft, was driving long distance routes between San Francisco and Los Angeles, going up to Reno, trying to figure out what is the way in which we get some traction that they launched Lyft. That's two years between when we seed finance them, throwing away a ton of code, even firing a bunch of customers to get to Lyft. That is a very, very long journey. And it's a very unexpected journey. And they were successful here because they didn't raise that much capital at that high valuation. And they gave themselves the chance to earn their secrets to have the timeline that they needed to, and the ability to figure out that product market fit. And when they hit it, within two weeks, we knew we had it. And so I want to pass this off to Iris to explain what happens after that stage, because that's where she comes in. That's right. So 
one area where we definitely have pause is when companies, as they're scaling, enter what we call unprofitable hypergrowth. Now, don't get me wrong, companies like Lyft may choose to blitz scale. And by that I mean they intentionally spend what seems like an irrational amount of money to try to get to dominant market share. But what I would argue is important here is that you do that with an eye to a longer term business model that at some point is scalable and ideally profitable so you become self-sustaining. There's a couple lessons that we've learned that we feel continue to emphasize this transition from being value seeking to then growth seeking. And it's not a trade off. It is still the core of creating value not only for the company, but also for the customer. So the three lessons that we'd like to, to have you focus on after you've already achieved product market fit. The first is to be intentional about raising capital. Now, obviously, in the prior slides, I gave you the kind of the good and the bad of how important capital is in a fact, as a factor in the potential success of a company. But one of the exercises we go through with our founders at Floodgate is this concept of creating a fundraising roadmap. In the same way that you have a product roadmap, we want you to be very intentional about, about deciding when to fundraise, how much, and just as importantly, why. I never want the answer to the question of, why are you fundraising to be because I ran out of money? Nor do I want it to be, when I ask you how much, the answer to be 12 to 18 months. What I would love to hear is instead, when one of our founders comes to us and says, I'd like to raise a Series B, one of our first questions back to them will be, that's great, what are you gonna pitch your Series C off of? What will you have achieved with the money that you raise in your B? How will you be positioned for success? And then let's work backwards from there. So fundraising, like everything else about your company, should be with a lens to a much longer trajectory. On a related note to that fundraising is the fact that whatever got you here won't get you there. Meaning that in venture, for, with each stage of growth that you encounter and the associated fundraising rounds, the expectations, I would argue, grow exponentially, not linearly. And so that's something you have to be cognizant of as you take on additional funding. Will you be able to show significant growth, not just replicating what you've already done, to be able to warrant the valuation and the investment that you're seeking? And then lesson number three is about knowing your long-term business model. Now, as we talked about in the various stages of what we like to call intelligent growth, you need to know what your path to an exit is. It may be uh, going public as a standalone company, like one of our portfolio companies, Okta, shown here. It may be instead becoming profitable quickly so that you control your own fate. It may be selling to a strategic someday. We would argue that those tend to be three very different profiles. And so you tend not to just luck luckily fall upon them. You have to be intentional about which exit you're pursuing. If, if, you, if you don't follow that intentional path, we like to say you're in the denial profile. And one of the reasons why we think lesson three is also important is because you owe it to your employees, right? You kind of need to know that your employees are working on your behalf tirelessly because there will be a liquidity event at some point in the future. Now, oftentimes when we talk about the iteration of finding product market fit, as Anne mentioned earlier, that process can take years. But we actually have one of our portfolio companies for whom it was on an accelerated time frame. So Rappi is a delivery service based down in South America. They launched in 2015 with two markets, Colombia and Mexico. But they launched with multiple products where they were offering delivery from grocery stores, pharmacies, restaurants, and even ATMs. They graduated from YC and raised a $9 million seed round. But what's interesting and noteworthy that most people don't realize is within a year of having launched, they were able to get their unit economics so dialed in that each delivery was already at a positive contribution margin. It was only after figuring out the unit economics that they then aggressively raised a growth round to be able to expand throughout Latin America. So the lesson I would like to take away from Rappi is not that they've already raised more than 400 million, but it only took them a year, and they intentionally launched with multiple products to try to force themselves to get dialed in the unit economics before they decided to expand. So hopefully what you can take away from Anna and my discussion today is that at least at Floodgate, while we want to be your biggest cheerleader, we're also gonna be your support system where we have the honest discussion with you about what stage of growth you're at, 
what path you're on, and how best to create a legendary company that's capital efficient for the future. And if that means we might be the right partner for you, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you.